Hi, I'm Rhys Lawton and this is Mainstream Media, watching the mainstream news so you don't have to. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Let's grab a gallon of news and say fuck it, we'll wait for the inquiry. <laughs> The Covid party scandal is back, and this time the Prime Minister's really in trouble. I think. Might wriggle out of it again. We'll see. But which party? That Christmas one in number 10? Boris hosting a quiz? The one outside with wine, cheese and a baby? No, none of them. New one. May 2020. Amazed anyone in Downing Street found time to do any actual work. Maybe they didn't. Hence the massive mess. I know what you're thinking. We've been here before. Maybe there's some doubt about it. No, looks pretty clear-cut. This time there's an actual invite to 100 people. B-Y-O-B-B. Bring your own booze, Boris. Event liaison was even Boris's principal private secretary himself, Marty Party Reynolds. Lovely weather. How's about a few drinky poos? 6 p.m., bring a bottle. Be there or be, well, like the rest of the plebs. So, was Boris there? Well, yes, he admitted it. Loads of people saw him. Kind of hard to deny. Sorry, he told MPs, but with that classic politician's apology, sorry if you're unhappy. Brutal headlines. Well, a few of them. Actually, not as bad as they could have been. The Mail led on those supporting him. The Express gave him another chance as usual. Good to have friends at a time like this. The best of the anger came from the Labour leader. For once, he didn't muck it up. Resign, raged Sir Keir Starmer. The party's over. Like a dad finding out the kids have trashed his house. No, said the PM. I only went for 25 minutes. I thought it was a work thing. I didn't get Martin's invite. Only dawned on me later that all that booze and food might be a bloody party. Should have done things differently, shouldn't I? But number 10's a place of work, so it's also technically a work thing. So I'm still right. OK, then. A work do, yeah. Who doesn't have a good old drink at work? Because it's the 70s again, isn't it? I guess it might be an argument. An awful one, but an argument nonetheless. If only the people who work there were there. ITV's Robert Peston had the scoop. There were outsiders. Actually, that's old Rob taking credit for a scoop the Lib Dems and the Daily Mail already had. But what about the real question? Did Boris bring his own booze? His people won't even confirm or deny that. If he did, well, his whole I didn't know a party when I saw it goes up in smoke. If he didn't, he's the kind of guy who rocks up, helps himself to someone else's beer and buggers off after half an hour when he realises it all looks a bit suspect. All, all that, as you know, is the subject of a, uh, a proper uh, investigation by Sue Gray. Yes, the investigation by Sue Fifty Shades of Grey. The civil servant whose remit is growing by the second. Or Sue Gary, if you're watching Sky. I think she's actually on 50 parties at this rate. Can't be far off. For Bojo, they're like kids. Sometimes you have so many you can't remember and have to be taken to court to acknowledge them. But wait for Sue is the line. Conveniently for Boris, though, she can't actually sack him. The PM's judge and jury. He could ignore the report if it's not really what he wants. Yes, really. Glad to hear Boris thinks it was within the rules. I don't think we were allowed to party. There are even laws about it. Loads of people got fined for this kind of thing. You can meet one person outside your household in an outdoor public place. Full lockdown! Lots of rules. Some geeks probably read all of them. Where in the rules did it say that it's OK to go into a garden with your colleagues and get drunk? So I think the reason that um, he uh, clearly... Um, wanted to apologise because he implicitly thought that, that you know, this was, you know, part of his work. Good try, Nadim. And it's good to have you back, Robert. You'd think the police would be involved. The Met tried very hard to dodge previous investigations due to lack of evidence. But the evidence for this one is right there in black and white. You know, the invite at the start. Just rewind a few minutes if you need it again. I'll wait. OK. The Telegraph even found a barrister who thinks Johnson could face prosecution as an accessory to a crime. All this does depend on the Met bothering. Maybe they should get Derbyshire police to step in. They spent the first lockdown using drones to collar people going on non-essential walks. Isn't living in the future grand? Oh, apparently the Met are in contact with the Cabinet Office. How decent of them. Maybe they're trying to find out where Cressida Dick's invite was. For now, everyone's rallied round Boris. Except the Scottish Tory leader who's called on him to quit. 
Is that a problem? Jacob Rees-Mogg? Douglas Ross has always been quite a lightweight figure, so I don't think Oof. that... Yeah, Ross is shit, isn't he? And nobody, just like the Boris of Scotland... Sure, that's not the title he goes with. Try the others. More than 20 cabinet ministers were strong-armed into... Sorry, gave him their full backing. Well, for the most part. Leading the charge, Home Secretary Priti Patel, despite being the one who told us to dob in our neighbours for partying. Probably returning the favour for Boris, telling them all to rally round the Pritster when she was accused of being a bit of a bully. And right at the back, looking a bit awkward, were Chancellor Rishi Sunak and Foreign Secretary Liz Truss, who both took till the late evening to finally tweet some half-hearted mumblings of support. Time-limited support from Rishi, Liz is standing behind him, probably with a knife. Both know that if it all goes tits up, and it surely will, they don't want their own leadership campaigns to be tainted with this kind of rubbish. Maybe simpler to stick to the facts. I don't know um, what did or didn't happen. Those are the two options, yes. Ed Argar, health minister there, though easy to believe he didn't get an invite. Or maybe you go even further than anyone else. Eh, Michael Fabricant? Tory backbencher, this guy. Those of a nervous disposition look away now. The risk of contagion is far greater in a building than going outside but in it... a garden where people could not mix... Let me just finish. Where people could not mix with them because it's a secure area. You don't tend to get that elsewhere. So from a COVID point of view, I would argue it was not actually a bigger risk as having to work there anyway. Safer at a party than at work. You'll be rewarded well, Michael. A gift certificate to the Tony and Guy of your choice. Rather less to celebrate when it comes to the current state of COVID. All the news actually seems very geared towards it's over, because most outlets and politicians want it to be. This week, one of the guys who guided us through it all, Jonathan Van Tam, even quit. Yes, back to the University of Nottingham for him. Sad loss, particularly his football analogies. Game over, we've won! Have we, though? We hit 150,000 deaths last weekend. Yeah, sorry to bring the mood down. Oh, you missed it! Not that surprising. Literally no one in the press noticed. Much more important stuff bumped it, like the Home Secretary announcing another crime crackdown, Danny Dyer leaving the East End, is that right? And Yuri Geller finding the Ark of the Covenant. Don't open the box! Actually, do. Can't be much worse than what we've got. And sometimes you just want to see some Nazi faces melt. But politicians are desperate to draw a line under Covid too. Like Rishi Danger Sunak, the man who gave us Eat Out to Help Out. Yes, that glorious time of dining in Nando's and cunnilingus puns, which Boffin said only succeeded in spreading the virus. Uh, the dining in, not the oral sex. Stay safe, kids. Likes living on the edge, does Sunak. He said cut the Covid isolation period, but actually on this he was ahead of the curve. The government quickly agreed. Why? The UK Health Security Agency made a bit of a boo-boo here. Yes, the artists formerly known as Public Health England, who took the reins last year after PHE took the flak for fucking up test and trace. For weeks, ministers have been using their advice to rebut calls to reduce isolation, saying rules are in line with the USA. It's five days there, sure but only because they start the clock from a positive test rather than symptoms. We know what we're doing! Actually, they don't. That's totally wrong. We both start from symptoms. Ugh. Surely someone should have, like, checked it? Maybe they didn't because it was convenient to follow that bad science. Now they want to slash the isolation time. Piss on it. That can't be right. Tests are changing too. The government's scrapping free lateral flow tests, right? Says right there. OK, sure. I mean, that'll keep the case numbers low, won't it? Is that happening, though? Flotus. We are not calling to an end for free to lateral flow. Where did that story come from, then, Nadim? The Sunday Times made it all up? No, a Whitehall source. And it's the government's own strategy, which says it will happen at some point. It costs billions. It can't go on indefinitely. But it's your classic, let's leak this, see what people make of it. Oh, they hate it. Quick, pretend it's not on the cards. Just yet. At least all the Covid testing rules are now much simpler this week. Everyone clear? First, those lateral flow tests are all you really need, if you can get some. My mate Dave's got a vanful. He'll sort you out. PCRs? Nah, old news. If you've got a positive lap flow, the government says it's highly likely that you've got it. Heard that before, usually when it's bollocks. So the point of the PCRs before was... Well, they're meant to be more accurate, especially for Omicron. But I guess someone's decided they're too expensive. Or they've run out. Or just because, don't question me, I mean, them. 
Just assume you've got COVID, yeah? Like former Health Secretary Matt Hancock. He's OK, though, the Evening Standard tells his fans. Less info from Matt about those VIP COVID procurement lanes he used to give contracts to his chums. You know, like the ones the court just ruled were unlawful. Matt, shh! Maybe lie low a bit? Take the wife and mistress on holes. Luckily on travel, oh, God, it's all so simple now. Don't need a pre-departure test to come back. Just come. Bring your friends. Lick them. Don't worry about anything, least of all COVID. Just a cheeky lateral flow when you get here. No PCR, forget that crap, didn't you hear before? It'll be fine. What's the worst that could happen? Well, you've got COVID and you've just given it to your nan. Move on. Daily lateral flow tests for 100,000 critical workers. Why? No idea. No extra help isolating or anything like that. Just keep testing, assuming anyone's got any left. The tests, not the workers, though both are in short supply. Actually, workers are in such short supply, we've even had the army involved. Tanks on hospital lawns, shooting guns in the air to get things moving a bit. Give those doctors a fright. No, of course not. Helping with the logistics, of course. Now, I know some overly anxious people get in a bit of a tiz about that kind of thing, but it's not some kind of armed insurrection. No one needs that making clear. When you talk about armed forces, you know, around hospitals, they're not sitting there in combat or anything like that. Weirdly, when the business minister, Paul Scully, did make that clear, I'm suddenly a bit more on edge. Yes, hospitals are overwhelmed. Lots of staff off sick. How many staff? NHS hospital staff COVID-related absences in England are up by more than 40% in the space of a week. That's pretty bad. Maybe read the papers where it's definitely under 40%. Or watch GB News, where it's much worse. Troops are being deployed at London hospitals as NHS staff absences due to COVID rise 59% in a week. Bloody GB News, always getting it a bit wrong, bless them. Except no, GB had the right and the left on side too, weirdly. Why the divide? Well, it's the difference between NHS hospital staff off, around 40%, and NHS hospital trust staff off, which includes community care, around 60% which no one bothered to clear up. Then again, in journalism, you just need two sources. Well done, BBC and GB. You're both right. Have a lollipop. The US has a unique solution to this. Why not plug the shortage by letting vaccinated workers carry on, even if they've got COVID? Well, because that would be mad. But on Planet Joe Biden, if nurses have had the jab, they can return to work, even if they've got the virus, providing they're only mildly symptomatic. CNN loves it. The right move to stop staff shortages, says its medical analyst. Well, yes, as long as you don't mind those staff having COVID. They're also banning the unvaxxed from working at all, even if they've tested negative for COVID. That's on its way over here too, and Health Secretary Sajid Javid thought he'd find out what those at the coalface thought. You're not happy about it, tell me. Yeah. So, I've had COVID at some point. Yeah. Uh, I've got antibodies. Yeah. Um, I've been working on COVID ITU since the beginning. Yeah. I have not had a vaccination. I did not want to have a vaccination. Um, uh, the vaccine's reducing transmission only for about eight weeks with Delta. With Omicron, it's probably less. And for that, I would be dismissed if I don't have a vaccine. It's not, the science isn't strong enough. That's your view. And, and, and your views? Yes, that doctor seems to have the wrong take on it. Anyone else got a more palatable one? This row was a weird one. That policy doesn't kick in until the end of March, and the Sarge did literally ask for it. Almost like he was trying to create a bit of a storm. Whip something up for the cameras. A distraction? God forbid, from what? Oh, maybe a Downing Street party. I'm sure it's a coincidence. But speaking of getting kicked out of your job because of your vaccine views, let's not forget poor old Majid Nawaz, formerly of LBC, now in the wilderness, like a paper bag in the breeze, said he refused to go quietly, then did after he realised that shouting wasn't as good as a microphone. Yeah, you know him. On LBC Radio, leading Britain's conversation, the former extremist turned poster boy for counter-extremism. Isn't he marvellous? A true example to us all. Lead our conversation, Majid. Show us the way. Oh, until he started having the wrong conversation about vaccines. Not on air, of course, on Twitter. Anti-boosters, side effects of jabs and stuff about state psyops and the new world order. Not my cup of tea, I'm much more the hide-in-the-bunker type. But when you're on Shock Jock Radio, that kind of stuff used to be mandated. And nothing about it on his actual show either. 
Perhaps it's most telling that he'd clashed with LBC stalwart Ian Dale, who accused him of tweeting deranged rubbish. After all that deranged rubbish, he tweeted. But not a fan of dissent, is Ian. Perhaps he should be one of the Sarge's enforcers. Yes, the same Ian Dale who got cautioned for assault after trying to forcibly remove an anti-nuclear protester from a TV interview in 2013. This is what happened when a protester tried to appear on the back of an interview with Damon McBride. Now, you may recognise that as Ian Dale. Uh, former Conservative candidate. Kept his job, though. Back on the mic. Unlike Majid, who's out, the network said, after discussions. Which probably went along the lines of, Sorry, mate, your social media posts aren't very on message. Have you considered joining TikTok? <laughs> Shall we check in on Prince Andrew? Probably best. It's been a whole minute or so since he was last on the front pages. Oh, dear, that all looks a bit shit. Yes, facing trial later this year. Did share the front pages with Partygate. Thank God Boris and Andy had each other. Last time, it was all looking so rosy. I mean, as rosy as it gets when you're facing a civil case for sex assault and battery. Yes, Virginia Jeffrey's still after him in the New York courts. But he's got a crack team on it. Pinochet's lawyer, Charles Bronson's lawyer, and good news Gary, who gives Andy the best case scenarios. On £1,000 an hour. For that cash, I'll tell him it's all fine. But, and join in on the bits you know, he didn't recall meeting her. Ignore that picture of them with his close personal friend and sex trafficker Ghislaine Maxwell, he meets so many people. Not only that, but he was busy at a Pizza Express in Woking when he was meant to have been doing some sweaty dancing with her. And he can't sweat anyway. We all know it by heart, especially Andy. When we last met him, though he doesn't remember naturally, his lawyers were busy trying to get the case thrown out. They claimed a deal Virginia signed with billionaire Jeffrey Epstein cleared him. Because getting off on a technicality, particularly a gagging order courtesy of a convicted paedophile, is such a great look. Anyway, the judge said no. That deal was meant to be secret. Only Epstein can enforce it. Unfortunately for Andy, of course, he can't. He's a g g, -g ghost See you in court, said the judge. Because it's kind of what judges do. Bad news for the prince. He's always been very keen to get back into royal life. He has no good options now. Of course, Andy might win. Didn't think of that, did you, Witchell? All the royals hate you anyway. I mean, sure, Nick, it looks bad, but he denies everything. That's not good enough for the mainstream media either. Even for the Royalist Brigade, the mood's clear and the language is changing. Before, his legal team was simply pursuing all options. Now they're getting desperate about it. Andy's reputation is beyond repair. His so-called mates in the Grenadier Guards hate him. He's even behind all the dodgy foreign cash flooding into Britain. A bit of a curveball, that last one. Yeah, throw any mud you've got. Look, I'm no fan, but the guy's not on trial yet. He's not even on trial soon. And a civil case is about cash, not possible jail time. But guilty in the eyes of the media. And for Andy, that's probably worse. That said, it'll all be absolutely fine. I'll take my thousand pounds now. <laughs> More bad news for the government this week, as if any more could cause the ship to sink any lower than the seabed. Yes, a court ruled that the dishing out of Covid contracts was very wrong. Unlawful, in fact. So, what had been going on? Well, remember the so-called VIP lane, where the Tories could refer their chums to get priority treatment for highly lucrative deals supplying protective kit? Even if you had no experience, like Matt Hancock's local pub landlord. Maybe you just set up a new company to get the cash. Or perhaps just had a good contact. PR firm Public First, that's the one with a hotline to Michael Gove and Dominic Cummings. Another court case already found that unlawful as well. What about Randox and Owen Patterson? MedPro and Lady Moan. Sells knickers, hence the pick in the sun. There's a journalistic reason, you know. I could go on, but there's like 500 of these. Looked a bit like profiteering from a massive crisis. Looked a bit corrupt, because it was. Some, like me, didn't just laugh or cry. This guy, Jolly on Mom, Legal Eagle, brought the case. Now, I'm not his biggest fan either. He's best known for clubbing a fox to death while wearing his pyjamas. Jolly, not the fox. He was wearing a red fur coat. I digress. The judge agreed with him. The fox deserved it. And the contracts thing was a crock of shit too. The government had tried to argue, and still does, that suspending the proper tender process during a pandemic was necessary to get stuff quickly. Which might have been OK if they hadn't fucked it all up. Remember the 400,000 gowns they got from Turkey that were so shit they had to be destroyed? Classic. 
Anyway, not all bad news. The two companies in this court case, Ayanda and Pestfox, I mean Pestfix, would have got the contracts anyway under a proper process. That's what the government's clinging on to. Not quite the point of it, though. All the papers, bar The Guardian, buried it. Normally, that's a bit dodge, but so much other shit hitting the fan. And let's be fair, when there's so much else going on that might bring the House of Cards crashing down, it hardly matters to the mainstream press or Boris Johnson if there's one more massive fuck-up. Just stick it on the list, we'll get to it. <laughs> Did you hear about the cost of living crisis? Sure you did! If you tried switching electricity supplier, jumping on a train or buying literally anything at all, you'll know what I'm talking about. Energy bills sky high, going up 50% more in April. Inflation up, petrol prices up, train fares up. Those are rising 3.8% because they've upgraded all the services. Very swish. The 7.45 from Reading to Paddington has got a milkshake bar and an aquarium. No, they haven't. It's because, like... Fuck you! And we've got that national insurance rise coming too. 1.25%. Great. Everyone hit with a tax hike so well-off pensioners keep their massive houses. Regressive what? Hooray! Said the Tory cheerleaders. Or at least, it's necessary, isn't it? But that was before it all started to bite. Now they're all on Boris's case. Even the Daily Mail! No, not because they're suddenly concerned about the little guy. Because there's a big risk people might start wondering is this really the low-tax Tories? Why don't we try the other guys? What have we got to lose? But, but, the free market economy, though. Stay with the programme, you Tories. That'll sort it. You'll love it. The market will correct itself. The energy companies will work it all out. Uh, the invisible hand. Well, the third biggest supplier, Ovo, told customers to cuddle Fido, eat porridge and some other mad stuff, too. Not only layer up, but get the heart rate going with some star jumps. And if that doesn't work, how about a cosy little cuddle with a cat? OK, I don't have a cat, but I do have this guy. Another simple suggestion is to leave the oven door open after cooking. Be careful of your kids, though, and eat a hearty bowl of porridge. Which is why Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak tried to knock heads together this week. Well, Boris did. Rishi was a bit cagey. Did they decide anything? More help for energy bills? Tax cut? Well, no even though we know Rishi's a low-tax kind of guy. My ambition is to lower taxes for people. Yeah, but you haven't, have you? Like, ever. Rishi's in charge of the purse strings and doesn't want Boris to have a win right now because he wants Boris's job and wants a bit of blue water between them. Maybe that's why he did a 200-mile dash to talk about local jobs in Devon. He also thinks Boris will be out soon. Could be sooner rather than later if he's got more pictures of number 10 parties. Yeah, no, I'm sure it wasn't him who took it. But others in Cabinet see the problem with holding back. Step forward, modern-day Robin Hood, Jacob Rees-Mogg. I'm a man of the people. Vox populi, vox dei. Yes, nothing says man of the people more than a language of the people who've been dead for a millennium. I believe you, Mr Moneybags. The honourable member for the 18th century loves the bedroom tax, hates same-sex marriage and abortion and the benefit system. Not known for his compassion. Like, say, implying the victims of the Grenfell Tower tragedy only had themselves to blame. If either of us were in a fire, whatever the fire brigade said, we would leave the burning building. It just seems the common sense thing to do. Maybe he's changed. Did those three ghosts actually manage to pull it off? It seems good old Jake had a right go at the Chancellor about the national insurance hike, even though some tried to downplay it. We have a collective uh, uh, position. Sure, Grant, but in political speak, that just means promising not to have a go at each other in public. And Rees Mogg didn't. He's too polite for that. Got his nanny to chat shit about it instead. Anyway, according to sources, which may or may not have been his nanny, he told the Chancellor to scrap it. Why? Well, when you've got many large houses to heat, you start to feel the pinch. Actually, Mogg also had a dig at those lazy civil servants working from home. Why not sack them instead to raise the cash? And there, it seems, is the real story. Not on the side of the poor, just gives him an excuse to bang the drum for scrapping remote working and downsizing the public sector. That's the infighting. What about the actual opposition? Well, Labour wants all kinds of stuff. A windfall tax on North Sea oil and gas, scrap VAT on energy for consumers, reduce average bills by £200. Oh, and have a go at the Russians. We are too reliant on the Russians, for example, for uh, our basic gas needs. How much do we get from Russia? Around 1%. 
Seems like Moscow's the real problem here. It's OK, though. Foreign Secretary Liz Truss is on her way there at some point. Well, she says she wants to go. Until then, just, like, put a jumper on, ride it to work and eat it. Crisis over. <laughs> Remember Boris Johnson's flat? Yeah, you do. Right dump. What the hell did Theresa May and Phil do to it? Tear down the wallpaper? Leopard print rugs? Fish behind the radiators? Well, anyway, there was a massive row over who did it up, because they did such a crap job. Nah, not really, because spending over £100,000 on a flat you might not be living in by the end of the year seems a bit excessive. I followed the ministerial guidance at all times. Good to know. That the end of it? No. Well, actually, yes. Yep, Boris paid for it all himself, but only after trying very hard not to. What actually happened? Well, his mate Lord Brownlow gave the Tory party £67,000 out of the goodness of his heart to help cover the work or 1.6 million party rings, as part of a trust which never actually existed and was only him anyway. Sounds like a right load of balls, because it was. The Electoral Commission said that hadn't all been properly declared and fined the party £17,800, for context again, around half a million party rings. All nothing to do with Boris, though. He's waiting for the inquiry to see if he ate any. What was to do with Boris were the WhatsApps he sent to Lord Brownnose, revealed by that same commission. Flat's a tip, my lord. Want to get Lulu, that's a posho decorator, not the singer, to fix it up. Give her the cash. I'm on the Great Exhibition 2.0 plan. Sorry, what's that? That was an exhibition old brown envelopes wanted to run. And in reply, will do, PM. Thanks for thinking about the exhibition. Now, some people might see that as cash for access. The exhibition didn't happen, thank God. Did you see the first one? Right load of old crap. Of course, there's no suggestion anyone's done anything wrong, as I've got to say. But if they haven't, someone needs to have a long, hard look at what is allowed. Interestingly, the messages weren't revealed to another lord, Lord Christopher Geit, the independent ethics advisor, during his report. Why not? Oh, Boris says he changed phones. Very sorry, mate. Humble apologies. Sure, because when you change phones, WhatsApp deletes all your messages, doesn't it? No. No, it doesn't. So now, obviously, Geit's resigned and someone else will investigate. Nah, not really. Geit took another look and said, no, he's a bit cross about it, obviously, but his view still stands. Even if he had known about those messages, which he really should have, he still thinks Bojo's in the clear. The new phone who dis defence strikes again. Corruption much? Labour thinks so. And trade union leader Dave Penman says it's all too chummy and close. If you require the Prime Minister's say-so to investigate the Prime Minister, there's an obvious conflict there in the Committee for Standards and Public Life in their report in November made clear that that is one of the reforms that really needs to come forward, as well as the ability to make a decision on the ministerial code. Yeah, you might have been surprised that Dave was the first black male to win an Oscar. He probably was too. Someone got a little too eager there as the channel was about to announce the death of Sidney Poitier. You know who else isn't investigating Boris? Well, yes, Sidney Poitier, I see what you did there. But also the Parliamentary Standards Commissioner. Yes, Catherine Stone, the one Boris tried to make disappear during that botched attempt to get his mate Owen Patterson off the hook. You'd think she'd relish the opportunity. Anyway, no dice. Case closed yet again. Or, and one for the sub-editors this, prosecution no-go over Bojo Home Reno no-no. What's at me if you want to use that one? No, no, on the new phone. <laughs> You know who's planning a comeback? Jeremy Corbyn, the true king of Gondor. At least if you believe the rumours on the mainstream grapevine. Now, I know what you're thinking. He's still an MP, isn't he? What's this comeback all about? Well, a new party, the Peace and Justice Party, all according to those who, let's say, aren't natural Corbyn cheerleaders. Weird. Anyway, Jez is back, and baby, he's never been better. Seems legit. I think he said it himself. We're going to bring people together for social justice, peace and human rights. Hey! Actually, that's just him launching the Peace and Justice Project, a charity, a year ago. It's suspicious that those papers seem to be cheering him on. The same guys who accuse him of being in league with Hamas, the IRA and the Russians. Like, remember when he got a Russian-owned company to refit the Downing Street briefing room? Clever, that, wasn't it? Without even winning the election. Oh, 
wait, that was the other guy. Corbyn's connection was wearing the same hat as Lenin did. Now, it's fair to say Jeremy's no friend of the current Labour leader, despite Jezza having given Keir a job in his shadow cabinet. But Corbyn's in a party already. The Labour Party. Yes, contrary to popular belief, still a member, having served a suspension following that report into anti-Semitism. Starmer insisted it was up to officials to decide Jeremy's fate. But when they decided wrong, he blocked his predecessor's route back to the parliamentary Labour Party. All meaning Jez can't stand under the Labour banner at the next election. He remains an independent. What about the new party, then? Any truth in it? Well, no. The Peace and Justice Project says there are no plans for it to become a party. The Telegraph got the scoop. The other Tory papers lapped it up. Why? Because it all causes more trouble for Keir. Corbyn's just a convenient stick for them to beat him with. Ah, oh, well. And more bad fake news for Jeremy this week, too. This time in the Daily Mail. Yes, Mary Cray, a former Labour MP who apparently blames him for her loss in 2019. She could stand against him at the next election. Oh, no! What will he do? Could be curtains for the guy who's represented that constituency for nearly 40 years. Is she going to? Well, if you read all the way to the bottom, no. Next week in the mail, Jeremy Corbyn kills a swan while eating a poppy, live on Centre Court. <laughs> and now for my Scream of the Week. It's one year since the January 6th attack on the US Capitol, when supporters of Donald Trump stormed this building, trying to prevent the election victory of Joe Biden from being certified. On the anniversary... <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, God, Sam. Oh. So that's me, Rhys Lawton, and until next time, I will be watching the mainstream news so you don't have to. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can watch me grow into my final form with huge mechanical arms and lasers for a heart. <laughs> have a lovely week.